When we say we want to keep food from going bad, we're going to have to characterize what that means. There's a number of different ways something can go bad, some of which are more important and possibly uh, harmful to human health, some of which are just inconveniences because they make something taste less good. For example, this pepper, which I bought a week ago, you can see it's gotten a little bit wrinkly. That means it's a little bit past its prime and might not be as crisp as it would have been otherwise. But I wouldn't go so far as to call this bad yet. It's not awesome, but bad would be turning black, having white fuzzy spots on it. So let's get into the difference between these different types of bad uh, and how we uh, preserve against each of them. Because what keeps this crisp and what keeps it from turning fuzzy might be two different things, and in fact are. All right, let's focus in on what I'm going to call internal spoilage. That is fruits and vegetables going off because of things that happen without any outside influence of microbes. Okay, so here are a bunch of options. And let's go through them one at a time and talk about what happens. So water loss. That's pretty much what was happening to the pepper that I showed you on the last page. So, uh, well, obviously there's less water, but we need to zoom in and look at the cells that make up a plant uh, to understand a little bit of what less water actually mean. So these things I'm drawing here represent our cells, and there's a little bit of between cell space, interstitial space, uh, that might be taken up with connective uh, stuff, or it might be taken up with fluid. And this is uh, on the inside of our, uh, of our fruit or vegetable. So perhaps the easiest thing to imagine here is this is an apple. We are thinking <laughs> These are not drawn to scale uh, apple cells. Now, as time passes, some of the water that was in there will tend to evaporate. So the water just heads off into the air. And what does that do? Well, that means the cells, uh, as you may remember in the video about what's in food, that apples and most things we eat are upwards of 70% water by weight. Um, pretty much everything but the Cheez-It is mostly water. So when you lose some of that water, the uh, cells that are there tend to shrink and they kind of come apart from each other perhaps, um, and then they are smaller. And if you imagine the cells kind of like balloons that were all stuck together, we went from having uh, big full balloons uh, that uh, uh, really pop when you bite into them to having things that just kind of smush around. So what are some of the impacts? Well, it's mushy, it's not crisp, um, and flavor may change a little bit because um, some of the flavor compounds are dissolved in the water, and as there's less water, their, comp uh, their concentration changes, and that'll change the effect of their flavor. So that's like, yeah, I mean, it's not great, but it, it won't, it's not harmful. It just means that this apple that you're eating, or this carrot, instead of making a nice crisp chomp as you bite into it, now goes kind of like, Krunk. you know? I think everyone's had some food like that. So how can we possibly mitigate this? Mitigation is pretty much what you'd expect. If you somehow take your fruit and you coat it in something that water can't get through, let's say you take your apple and you completely cover it all over with wax, which is a hydrophobic compound. That means a nonpolar compound, something that water doesn't really like to dissolve in. You can seal it and keep the water from getting out. Something else you can do is, uh, and I wrote this in a complicated way, 
Eliminate the driving force for evaporation. Well, what's that mean? Well, there's this concept that we are going to talk about a lot because it's super important in food and it's important in thermodynamics, which is my other big class I teach. Um, and this concept is called water activity. And water activity is abbreviated A with a little W. Water activity is kind of like the concentration of water. Kind of like, not exactly, but it's kind of like the concentration of water. Um, but what's neat about it is it works across different kinds of materials that are in contact with each other. So water inside an apple is kind of in solution, right? It's, it's still basically liquid water. It's held in with cell walls, but it's, in, it's sitting there. It's in solution. Uh, and water in the air is in the air. And the uh, relative humidity is the same thing as the water activity. Whereas the molar concentration of water, we'll get into it later, uh, is the water activity for a condensed phase for a liquid. Uh, or for a solid, um, and there's a little, there's our friend, the star of simplification with that, because it's not exactly concentration, but it's it's close to concentration. Anyway, uh, and so that means uh, what you need to know about water activity right now is that water moves from where water activity is high, so kind of like water concentration is high, to where water activity is low. So you might think that the best way to eliminate evaporation would be to stick your food in the fridge because that's further away from the boiling point of water, right? So there should be less evaporation. So that is a good thought, but it's not all you need to think about because the air inside the refrigerator tends to be very dry. It has a low relative humidity, which means it has a low water activity. And so your nice veg that you've just popped into the fridge might still get all dried out because it's full of water. So it has a high water activity and water will on its own flow from high to low until they're matched. Okay, let's talk about uh, the next one. And I realized I wrote these in a poor order because I want to talk about chemical reaction oxidation and a little bit of enzymatic degradation, uh, a little bit at the same time. So chemical reaction. When you have big, long, complicated chemicals like proteins and polysaccharides uh, and fats sitting around, uh, and especially when you have them sitting around in an environment that contains oxygen, which is a highly reactive substance, it what tends to happen is over time, the oxygen gets in, especially where there's a place where there might be a, a double bond. And oxygen's always looking. Those of you who are fans of chemistry will, will know this. Oxygen always is looking for electrons. So it looks at that double bond and says, yum! And then that bond ends up broken. And you result, uh, you end up with some water. And this bond, uh, goes down to perhaps being a single bond or might get broken completely, depending on what the reaction is and how it's happening. Usually it just goes down to a single bond. But what that means is the chemicals you started out with aren't the chemicals you have after some period of time. And this is the sort of behavior we count on if you're trying to make, I don't know, scotch. You count on reactions spontaneously occurring because enough time has passed that those reactions become likely to occur. Uh, but if you want to have a nice fresh strawberry, you don't want that reaction to occur. So the effect here is that the flavor changes. And maybe a little bit, the nutrition changes. Because perhaps some of uh, the things that we counted on being in this food, such as the vitamins, degrade over time. They, they don't go away to nothing. They uh, just, it's chemical reactions occur. And instead of having the thing that we wanted there, this nice tasty chemical, we get something that's the reaction products of that, uh, of that original chemical. And it just isn't quite as nice. So that's something that can happen. Also, I should note, um, 
the uh, reactions might break down some of the structure. So the, the thing, the cell walls that were keeping these cells, uh, as I drew in the last blurb, keeping them nice and firm, maybe some of that gets broken down also, and so the fruit also becomes a bit more mushy. So how do you mitigate this? Well, I've kind of blurbed in. Um, what you want to do, you want to keep it away from oxygen. Now, oxygen isn't necessary for every single reaction, but it is an instigator for a lot of them. So getting rid of oxygen might help. And you're like, well, wait, where's the oxygen? Um, so air. Air is about 16% oxygen. The rest of it is mostly nitrogen, and there's a little other stuff in the mix as well. Uh, so if you keep the air out of what you're doing, then oxidation pretty much hap doesn't happen. Also, all chemical reactions go faster in general. Again, a little bit of a simplification, but you know, it's a good rule of thumb. Reactions go faster, the warmer it is. So if you keep this cool, uh, then it'll be slower. So that'll happen less. Something to think about, that's not the same thing as saying you're going to freeze it, because freezing it is a whole nother video. All right, let's talk about ev evaporation, and here I mean evaporation of things that aren't water. So one of the reasons that, that's a nose right there, see that nose? One of the reasons a nice tomato is so different than a uh, store-bought raw tomato is that um, it has what we call volatile compounds, which are very important to the flavor and the smell, which is the smell is part of the flavor. Um, and the experience of why a ripe tomato is so much nicer than uh, one that was just you know, shipped while green and has sat on a shelf for a while. Uh, volatile means, though, that that stuff is in the air. It's going from the substance up into the air, and over time, you run out, right? So it, it just kind of leaves. So what's the effect? Usually it's mostly on flavor, maybe a little bit on nutrition, but mostly on flavor. Um, and how do we... How do we deal with this? Well, keeping things cool um, keeps um, these substances further away from their boiling point, just like it worked for water. And so that might work well. Keeping them sealed may or may not work because uh, some of these nifty volatile compounds are soluble in some of the things we'd seal stuff with. So eh, on sealing. It works a little bit, but not perfect. Um, a test you can think of for yourself about this is if you uh, peel a clove of garlic and stick it in the butter drawer of your fridge, but not touching the butter, just sitting there. So you've got some butter sitting near the garlic, but they aren't touching each other, and you let that hang out for a day, I guarantee you'll be able to taste garlic in your butter. Okay, so that's the volatile compounds moving um, and you probably won't taste the garlic in, say, if you have a water pitcher in your fridge, you wouldn't taste it in the water. Um, that's because that uh, many of the most pungent compounds are more fat soluble. All right, last one. This one is fun and interesting. Enzymatic degradation. So, uh, star of simplification, come on in. What's the point of a fruit? Or some vegetables, but mostly it's easiest to think of this in terms of fruit. They exist to help a plant reproduce. So the plant has a mission. There's a reason there's a strawberry. And the reason for the strawberry is not entirely for us to have something to eat. It is in part to, for us to have something to eat because that's how the seeds uh, theoretically get dispersed. But um, the fruit really wants to be doing uh, some of its job to support its seeds. And so some of what a fruit does is entices animals like us to eat it and spread the seeds all over. But another part of what fruits do is provide a nice, safe, 
nutritious, fun place for uh, its seeds to germinate. That's something else that's going on there. And to help that along, so like uh, it's in the plant's interest to create fruit that will eventually kind of fall apart and let the seeds uh, and help the seeds grow. So all of that is a long bit of background talking about inside fruit, just like inside all living things, there are enzymes. And enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions. So for example, you have digestive enzymes and the reactions that catalyzes is the breakdown of various things that you have eaten. Um, so the uh, fruits and to some extent vegetables have enzymes in them uh, that are waiting for the right moment so they can start helping break down that uh, some of the components of that fruit into uh, their smaller component parts uh, to move things along. Um, there's also proteins that are enzymes um, that are doing other jobs, but these are the ones we worry about right now. Okay, so this uh, means that a fruit all by itself um, will eventually usually cued by something like a temperature change or bruising, uh, start to degrade itself. And the most common version of this that you have seen before is if you take a uh, apple or a avocado and you cut it in half and just let it sit around, um, you get what's called enzymatic browning. So enzymatic browning is uh, the surface of that fruit starting to discolor and turn darker as a result of oxygen. So it's oxidizing. It's that same reaction we were talking about over here. So oxygen is still important, uh, but as a result of the action of an enzyme, not merely at, as the result of time passing. Wow. That's cool. Okay. Um, so what do we get? We get effects, color change, texture change, and uh, flavor change. So pretty much everything can change. In general, these changes are not, are not bad for you. They're not particularly good for you usually, but they're not they're not bad, they just make the fruit be kind of a mushy, sticky mess, which, you know, blah. You don't like it, but it's not horrible. All right, so how do we fight this? What do we do here? Um, well, you've maybe you've had the experience. You put some lemon juice on your apple slices, right? So you denature or otherwise deactivate the enzyme. So what are some ways that might work? Sorry, I need to get myself more space, so I'm moving this a little bit. Um, you can use an acid, so that's what that lemon juice is doing. You can use heat. Well, <coughs> um, most enzymes stop working once you get them above 40 degrees C. That may have other consequences that your food starts feeling cooked, but that's why perhaps blanching would work. Um, and um, many enzymes deactivate with salt. So if you toss a bunch of salt on top of your apple, I bet you it won't brown. I, you probably don't want to eat it then, but you know, it won't be brown. So that's cool. Uh, so that's a set of things you can do. Another thing you could do, uh, of course, is um, keep it away from oxygen uh, in some of the same methods we mentioned before. And something super funky in here that's, that's kind of neat is that enzymes, so let's back up, enzymes 
are created by the fruit itself. So a fun engineering approach to this, if you want to do some food engineering, is you could breed, and maybe not through traditional breeding, but certainly through uh, site-directed um, uh, mutations on the plant's genome, a, a non-browning fruit or veg. Like you could actually get this thing to grow that way in the first place. You just edit that enzyme out of the DNA of that plant. Um, and that's, that's pretty intense. Okay, I talked for a long time on this video. Um, let's move on. Okay, this source of spoilage and contamination is so big that it's going to go into at least one, probably several more videos. But I want to hit an overview of it here. So microbial spoilage is when bacteria, so those are, go back and look at biology, those little single cell critters that uh, might be wanting to eat your food, um, possibly eukaryotes of some kind. I'm not sure about many of those showing up in food that often, but I know it's possible. And uh, specifically fungi, which includes both mold and yeast contamination, uh, gets onto the food. So what's the effect of that? So you've probably seen effects like these before. Uh, you might see some external effects, such as colored spots, maybe black spots on whatever that is. Um, you might see, for example, white fuzz. You might smell off smell um, as uh, things are turning. Um, and you would also sometimes, if this has gone far enough, uh, you will see um, overall degradation, degradation of the food. So its texture is going mushier, its uh, other stuff uh, about it is changing. Um, it doesn't really have the same structure anymore. And uh, the other part of this effect is that there are, that this is a little bit scarier than what we saw um, with the enzymatic degradation, uh, etc. on the last page, because some sorts of bacteria and some sorts of fungi uh, can either lead to human infections or they create uh, toxic compounds that can make you sick. So we worry about this quite a lot more than we tend to worry about the enzymatic stuff. Um, pardon me, even though the enzymatic stuff is more common. I also want to note here that microbial spoilage uh, is different from, but um, has some of the same issues and uh, importance that contamination does. So what's the difference between spoilage and contamination? So spoilage is, uh, I can see like this strawberry has mold growing on it. It is spoiled and then also it is contaminated. It has whatever it is this mold has been doing would be part of the food if I chose to still eat it. Um, there are things that can be just contaminated without being spoiled. So if you think back to, I think this was, was this last year, two years ago, um, there was an issue with romaine lettuce where several uh, batches of romaine lettuce that had been harvested in a particular area and then gone into the food system were found to have been contaminated with, I believe it was E. coli or salmonella. Those things were not um, growing on or in, um, you know, they're not from romaine lettuce typically. That's not their natural environment, but they'd gotten there because uh, some humans that were uh, sick had handled them. And so contamination had come through. So romaine, usually perfectly safe. We don't have to worry about that. But sometimes pretty much any sort of food that is handled by people can pick up bacteria or more rarely fungi from the people that are doing the handling if we aren't all careful. 
but a lot of the mitigations are the same. So um, here's our effects. So these are really important effects here. Um, and again, it's potential, right? Just because there's some bacteria on food doesn't mean that you get infected from that. It's just that um, there are some particular bacteria that are really bad to consume. And so we are very careful um, about all of them, especially when we're working at the level of the food system um, and not just you know, preparing something for yourself where you're willing to take a few risks on your own account. So um, we're gonna look at in upcoming or other videos that you'll see posted, we're gonna look at how it is we fight uh, bacteria and fungi in food. Uh, the short version is there's variations on the same idea that you um, kill the microbes that may be present um, and then you keep the stuff, whatever it is you've done, it clean. Um, and or make it hostile to uh, growth. So usually keeping stuff clear, well clear of microbial spoilage involves several steps. And you might think any one of those steps might work. And again, if you were just doing something at home for yourself, maybe it would. But uh, when we are doing things where our customers or others will be eating, say we were running a restaurant or we are um, a soup factory, um, we use multiple of these approaches in succession and at the same time to make it completely certain that there will be no contamination and no potential of either infection or toxins. So I'll be making several, several, uh, several separate videos on how these uh, different things, keeping it clean, killing the microbes, making the environment hostile to microbial growth, um, how that all works, and uh, we'll see you over there.